you would turn with me and your copies of God's Word to Galatians 3. We are continuing our series of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. We are reading other people's mail and being blessed thereby. So Galatians 3, 10 through 29, let me pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, we rest in your love. We are comforted by your love. We are freed to speak by your love. We are freed to confess our sins because of your great love for us. We look to so many other things for salvation, uh, to free us from condemnation. And yet, Lord, the only place where we truly find that is in your love. I pray that that would be lifted up as we read your word and hear preaching from your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, There's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to his promise. Thus ends the reading of God's word. C.S. Lewis tells the story of a little boy playing on the side of the street in the mud. The child is making mud pies, just taking a handful of mud, plopping it on the street, molding it into the shape of something that we would otherwise eat as it comes out of the oven. Childish, kind of impoverished, certainly disgusting activity. And the child's parent comes over to say, great news, we're going on a holiday to the beach, a beach vacation for the weekend. And the child answers, no, don't want to. Making mud pies. Want some? 
I'm offering you a beach vacation and you'd rather sit there and play in the mud. Do you even know what a beach vacation is? The child says, no. So the parent kindly explains, sand, surf, sun, sand castles. It's like playing the mud, but better. Floats, dolphins, volleyball, and then says, so are you ready to go to the beach? And the child answers, no, I'm playing with mud pies. If it was up to the child, the child would miss out on a wonderful vacation in order to get messy in the gutter. And sadly, many people would choose to continue struggling in their sin, satisfied with something far less quality and satisfaction and significance than choose to leave what they're doing. What they know in order to discover something far greater. And such a choice is what lies before each person. Such a choice even lay before the Jews of Galatia who had been living under the law circumcising their male offspring, abiding by certain food laws of the Old Testament, perhaps even traveling to Jerusalem once in a long while to make sacrifices. But there was nothing better on offer until Christ came. And with the coming of Christ, something far greater was on offer, not only to the Jews, but to all who would call on his name. It is good if you desire to live a moral life. It is good if you desire to set yourself apart to God. It is good to pay weekly attention to God's word. It is good if you recognize yourself to be a sinner. And acknowledge that in your bank account, um, acknowledge yourself to be a sinner and, and bring an offering to the Lord. All these things the Jewish diaspora was doing. When Paul came to them with news of something better, the gospel of Jesus. The life that they were living was like playing with mud pies compared to the surpassing greatness of the new life in Christ. So why choose the law when you could have Jesus? Because people know the law and they haven't really gotten to know Jesus yet. Because with the law, we can congratulate ourselves and denigrate others, but in Jesus, we're all recipients of grace. The law has limits to its claims upon us. We can have expectations for what type of life we're going to get if we abide by the law. Jesus, on the other hand, puts endless, comprehensive expectations on us since he indeed died for us. Jesus also told his disciples to expect persecution because the servant is not greater than the master. And this is why some people, after they've been introduced to Jesus, still find the law more attractive. But the law cursed. Look at verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Did you know that the law had a curse? It has many curses, as many cursings as blessings. Look at the cryptic quote of Leviticus 18.5, the one who does them shall live by them. What does that mean? Well, here's Leviticus 18.5 in, in Toto. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. And the Lord there was contrasting his statutes with the statutes of the Canaanites. Partly the Lord is saying, if you're going to live by rules, mine are better. More holy, more honest than the Canaanites. And if you do them, you'll live, you'll be blessed. Things will generally go well for you. But how thoroughly will you do them? If you don't do them totally, you don't do them. If you're found guilty in one area, you are condemned. And the Lord said that if you are careful to obey my commandments, they will be righteousness for you. Careful? Have you ever heard a toddler promise to be careful? Very careful. And it's especially ironic to hear them talk about how careful careful they were Uh, going to be as the broken pieces of your favorite thing lie exploded on the floor. I'm going to be very careful. The Jews 
were like that toddler. They intended to be careful with the law, but they broke it. Have you ever heard the saying, live by the sword? Die by the sword. If you make your living by killing, chances are you're going to end up being killed. If you take up the law to make life work for you, to judge others with, you too will be judged and found wanting. The law is good. It blesses as you follow it, but the problem is we break it. Then what? Curses. When I brought with me one of my favorite children's books. It's called Cyrus, the Unsinkable Sea Serpent. You can come up and read it afterwards if you want. And the story follows a, a ship of pilgrims as they uh, are traveling and they're about to set sail for a new land of freedom. And as they're leaving the dock, an old curmudgeon calls out from the land, cursing the ship. You'll never make it. You'll run into the doldrums and be stranded. The storm will take you. And if a storm doesn't get you, the pirates will. You'll never make it, I say. The book then goes on to describe how the pilgrim ship came to be stranded in the doldrums, almost foundered in a storm, and was eventually pursued by pirates. But the story isn't called the sad, slowly sinking ship. It's called Cyrus, the unsinkable sea serpent, because in each of the situations where the curse comes true, Cyrus intervenes to take the burden of undoing the curse upon himself. When the ship is stranded, Cyrus blows it along. When the ship is foundering, Cyrus inflates himself into a ship-sized life preserver. When the pirates attack, Cyrus attacks back. The story reminds me of what Paul says of Jesus. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. One of the things the law cursed was hanging. Jesus was hung. Another curse of the law was exile. Jesus was a refugee in Egypt. Another curse of the law was hunger. Jesus went without food for 40 days. Drought was a curse. Jesus said, I thirst. Defeat was a curse. Jesus was defeated in the court of the Gentiles, the court of the Romans, and the court of his own people. The Lord said in his cursings that a nation from far away would oppress you. Jesus was scourged by the Romans. Jesus took all the curses for disobeying the law of God, but he, he had never disobeyed the law of God. So one of the limits of the law is that it curses, but the good news of the gospel is that Jesus took those curses upon himself and opens up justification, salvation through another avenue. Belief in Jesus. We're talking about the limits of the law. The law didn't annul, make void. Paul argues that in verse 15, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. The law of God can't simply be wiped away, forgotten, hypocritically applied. No, God is just. The law must be satisfied. And there's two man-made covenant stories that you might remember from Sunday school. Daniel and the lion's den. The Jews, uh, and then um, Joseph, sorry, I've lost my, Daniel and the lion's den and Queen Esther uh, after Haman's law. Both of these human covenants couldn't be undone, you remember. They had to be worked around. Joseph had to be left in the lion's den. And the Jews were allowed to be attacked in Esther's time, but they were also now allowed to defend themselves and finance to do so. The law of God would slay us, curse us, send us to hell for our disobedience. Without dismantling that law, God yet provides a way. And if previous covenants aren't nullified, that means that God's previous covenant with Abraham isn't nullified. And that means that Gentiles can be justified by faith, by belief that God would provide a sacrifice, that God would provide a way for his commands to be honored. The Lord provided a ram when sacrifice was required of Abraham's son. And the Lord provided his son, 
when our sins would require our lives from us. So if one of the limitations of the law is that it does not annul previous covenants, then the riches of an inheritance from God can still be acquired by faith. The inheritance on offer to us Gentiles is everlasting life, entrance into glory, an incorruptible body, the Holy Spirit dwelling in our midst, God's own words on our lips and our actions representing the works of God on this earth. And the fruitfulness God promises us is vastly greater than a land flowing with milk and honey that was on offer to Abraham. We can become trees, vines, producing spiritual fruit. The the healing of the nations is coming, not merely the establishment of one nation among many. The inheritance of the new covenant vastly outshines the old covenant as the sun outshines the moon. Bask. Bathe in the glorious rays of the gospel of the Son. Let your very soul be warmed by the proclamation of his coming. Life, blessedness, victory, freedom. These are the vivifying effects of a mere day spent basking in his glory. Think of what happens to us after lifetimes in his presence. Glory. Hallelujah. The law was commanded due to sins. Paul asks a great question in verse 19. Why then the law? If the promise made to Abraham was greater than the law given to Moses, why was the law ever given? Wouldn't it have been better if we went from Abraham straight to Jesus, tenting in the promised land until the promised seed came, the prophet par excellence, the great father's great son? The law was not given because it was such a great development. Historians might be tempted to look back and see a great codification, a written word brilliantly summing up moral necessities for all time in the sum of the law. Governments could look back on the moral law as the basis upon which to build cities, rule nations, expand empires in a godly manner. But that's not why the law was given. It wasn't given as a shining example of man's philosophy and ingenuity. No, the law was given because of our sin. Abraham and his people, his sons and their daughters were sinning. Perhaps not on the level of Noah's day, but they were not heeding their God. They were not circumcising. They were not seeking the land of promise. They were not kicking out the Canaanites. They were not meeting with God and erecting stone altars to his name. They were complaining. They were creating false gods. They were worshiping God contrary to how he had required. They were whoring with the Canaanites. And that's all as God was giving them the law. So do you see more of the limitation of the law? The law is great. It's perfect. It's a lamp unto our path, but it is primarily negative and provides a base level of expectations for life. Don't steal. Does that really need to be said? Yes. Humanity is that fallen. Now, even with our books, even with the books of the law and the moral law summed up as love, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. But even that positive iteration of the law was given as a response to perennial sin. Do you see the limits of the law? Let's say a girlfriend, mad at her boyfriend, posted online all of his most embarrassing moments and pictures and sayings. The law would come to that situation and say, thou shalt not murder. The law can't fix that broken relationship, the broken trust, the wreckage left behind from her outburst. And that isn't a problem with the law. It's a limitation of the law. The law was never made to save. It was given in light of sin. The law couldn't give life. Under such scrutiny, the moral law of God comes out looking underwhelming. Not that great. In fact, Paul, for the sake of argument, asks whether the law is contrary to the promises of God. The promises of God to Abraham seem so positive. A life, a line, a land. The law comes in and says, this is how you'll lose. 
your life, your line, your land by crossing these thresholds. But the law isn't contrary to the promise. This is what so many get wrong about the law. To sit in judgment of the law and say, the law can't bring life. The law doesn't help us obtain the promises. And then not use it. It's like passing judgment on a ham and cheese sandwich saying, that ham and cheese sandwich isn't very good at solving math problems. That ham and cheese sandwich can't even write its own name. Well, it's a ham and cheese sandwich. It's not made to do those things. The law wasn't made to give us life. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with those who look on the law as if it were to give us life. What then gives life? A line, a land, faith in Jesus Christ. By faith, Abraham was saved. By faith, Moses was saved. By faith, David was saved. By faith, we are saved. And the only sufficient sacrifice to atone for all our sins is the lamb that was slain, the crucified Christ. Therefore, love the law. Use the law as a light unto your path. But those who seek to use the law as a foundation of their salvation will end up proving the case that the law is judged, but the law's judgment shows that they deserve condemnation. The law imprisoned until Christ. No puppy guarding. Did you ever play tag as a kid? Maybe freeze tag or capture the flag tag? And if you manage to tag and freeze somebody, your buddies don't like it if you just stood right next to the person you'd frozen, guarding them so closely that no one could unfreeze them, right? Or if you play capture the flag, players don't like it if you camp out, feet from the flag, guarding the flag so well that the game can't proceed. The law of God is like that guard closely guarding the enemy so that he does no more damage. We have lots of guards at our house. Each person in our house is a guard on the ice cream, the dessert box, the screen time. If even the smallest member of our household seeks to have access to any of those things without permission, the guards report to the maternal and paternal prison wardens. And there are rules and there are guards to protect the prisoners from themselves, from their sinning, from lack of self-control. And adults, if we are honest with ourselves, we need more guards than we have. We need someone watching our thoughts, our words, the working of our hands, our habits, our spending. The law functions as such. It provides a set of guidelines that we can all see and hold each other accountable to. The law condemns us for sin and points us away from itself as for a place to find life and salvation. The metaphor used by Paul is that of a pedagogue, a boy leader. Uh, It's translated guardian here. A boy leader who would see that the students reach the school. The pedagogue was not the teacher. He might ask the students what they were learning or lead them in some marching chant, but he was not the teacher, and everyone knew that. The law is like that until Christ came. Christ is the teacher. The pedagogue had a legitimate role to bring students to the teacher, but he should not be confused as the teacher. Who here, raise your hand, who here rode a bus to school? Okay. I rode the bus to elementary school for 30 to 40 minutes. I got some schoolwork or reading done on the bus, but it was not school. My bus drivers rarely spoke to us. If they did, it was to tell us to sit down or pipe down. We never confused them with our teacher. If my parents had asked me how school went and I replied, well, I didn't go to school, but I stayed on the bus and listened to the bus driver closely. They would not find that answer satisfactory. You get on the bus until you get to school, and then you get off the bus. You sit under the law until you get to Christ. Once Christ has been revealed to you, no longer be satisfied with mere rules, 
nor put all your hope in laws. Be satisfied in Christ and put your hope in him. The gospel is better even than such an illustration. In Christ, we're not merely God's pupils, we're God's sons. The law brings people to God in Christ from whom we can receive an inheritance as sons. In Christ, we are included in the will. In Christ, we have received new standing. In Christ, we have received a new purpose in life. In Christ, we have a new hope. Not merely to get by, but to flourish. Fulfilling our true and original purpose to glorify God. And we absolutely need forgiveness from sin and freedom from sin in order to live out that high calling. And the law can't free us from sin. It only finds out our sin. The law can't forgive us of our sin. We must look to Christ for our forgiveness of sin. You might be wondering, how does all this apply to me? I don't really think I need to obey Hebrew food and circumcision laws in order to be a Christian. I don't think I am justified by my obedience to God's law. I'm well aware that my disobedience to God's law condemns me. I realize that I'm only saved by Jesus and not by Jesus plus obedience to the law. Even for those who already believe all those things, there's still a temptation to view the law more highly than you ought. How so? How do you view the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the rule of law, legislation, We know it would be foolish to have too low a view of these things and think that laws don't matter and to do whatever is right in our own eyes. But it's also mistaken to look to law to save our country, to look to law to preserve our country, to look to our founding documents to preserve our freedom, prosperity, and blessed life. The law can't do that. The law, written by the finger of God could not do that for God's people in ancient Israel. The Lord handpicked, the rulers handwrote the policies, but still it was not enough to preserve or save. Salvation, preservation must come from another source, Jesus. Therefore, if we find ourselves thinking that a certain legislation will save us or doom us, we're thinking too highly of the law. No law can ensure our freedom from sin. No law can preserve our liberty. But no law can annul God's laws. No law can take away the life that we have in Christ. So look upon all the legal wrangling of Annapolis and Washington as the flower of the field. It springs up one day. It's gone the next. It's beautiful. It can be deadly. It can be powerless. But the word of God will stand forever. In conclusion, when people look to the law to justify them before God, they think too highly of the law. When people think the law has no purpose anymore, they despise a good gift that God has given. Let us therefore learn from the law. Allow the law to lead us to Jesus, our true teacher, our true redeemer, our real friend, and our elder brother in whom we receive the magnificent inheritance from God, our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Oh Jesus, there is much confusion about your law. Some think it it isn't helpful at all. Some think too highly of it. Lead us to you, Lord Christ. Allow the law to lead us to you and to our need for you and our salvation to be found in you. For only then can we cherish and appropriately appreciate your law if our salvation comes from somewhere else. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. For the law condemns us, for we are sinners, and it's not a problem with your law, it's a problem with us. And so we stand in need of you when we find all that we need in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.